Now from the Columbia Basin, your local news source, this is iFiber One News, presented in high definition. The number one source for real-time local news, local sports headlines, and our very own Weather Center forecast covering the entire Columbia Basin. With your iFiber One News team, reporting news in real time as it's happening. From the iFiber Communications HD broadcast studio in Ephrata, Washington, this is iFiber One News, and it starts now. Welcome to iFiber One News. I'm Cody Johnson with news from around the Columbia Basin for Monday, January 7th. We are back from a holiday break. We have upgraded some equipment, and we had hoped to have a new set to show you but we are still waiting on a few component components before we can use our new set. We thank you for your patience. Now on to news. Tonight we report on the future of Katana in Ephrata after the company sold its Columbus plant and the progress made by the state to help an endangered species here in Grant County. We look at how the Bonneville Power Administration intends to replace 28 miles of power lines and how the U.S. Supreme Court is going to hear two cases on same-sex marriage. In sports, we get a chance to relive the Seahawks' first postseason road victory since 1983. Our spotlight story tonight looks back to 1963 and some of the historical events that took place. And we have the latest weather forecast for the Columbia Basin from the iFiber One Weather Center. Our top story Katana Summit has sold its wind tower manufacturing facility in Nebraska, but it's unclear what will become of the company's Ephrata plant. Valmont Industries purchased Katana's Columbus plant for approximately $14 million and reportedly plans to use the facility to manufacture steel transmission structures. Four months ago, Katana announced it was seeking a buyer because of de decreased demand for wind turbines. The company cited failure by federal lawmakers to extend a tax credit in 2012. 79 employees in Ephrata were laid off. Washington fish and wildlife scientists are encouraged after a survey of pygmy, pygmy rabbits at the Sagebrush Flat Wildlife Area near Ephrata. Researcher Penny Becker says about 40 rabbits are using burrows outside of enclosures where a breeding program began in 2011. Only four rabbits were out counted outside enclosures last winter. Becker says the survival rate of about 40% this winter is better than the survival rate of 22% in Idaho and 10% in Oregon. Washington is trying to reestablish the pygmy rabbits in their historical range in the Columbia Basin. Pygmy rabbits were listed as federally endangered species in 2003. A lot of people in the Columbia Basin are being affected by the flu. We try a lot of different things to avoid catching it, but sometimes it's just not enough. Here is an idea that could make it easier to survive the flu season. Only a 10% chance of showers today, but a 70% chance of flu next month. That's the kind of forecasting health scientists are trying to move toward. So we're going for something where we could say there's a 50% uh, chance that in five weeks we're going to be at the peak of the flu outbreak in New York City, let's say. Such disease modeling got some attention recently when Jeffrey Shaman, a researcher at Columbia University and another scientist, said they could predict when flu season was going to peak in New York more than seven weeks in advance. Theirs is just the latest in a growing wave of disease models that factor in rainfall, temperature, or other weather conditions. The idea really is we're not using a weather model. We're using the techniques that they use in weather prediction. Diseases can be forecast by using statistical and mathematical models which simulate disease transmission in the population. That also involves observing searches for information on various diseases. They can actually do a... Um, uh, very localized uh, Google-based tool where they take information from a community and predict how much influ influenza is spread in that community. Some diseases like the flu are more predictable than others. Diseases for which we know the mode of transmission 
or for how many days the duration of illness is are easier to forecast and easier to model. Recently, health officials advised that flu season is off to its earliest start in 10 years, with the highest activity in five southern states. But experts note disease outbreaks are influenced as much by human behavior and other factors as by the weather. And that weather-based outbreak prediction still has a long way to go. Marina Hutchinson, The Associated Press. It would be nice to know when to start taking my vitamins. Over the holidays, 78 motorists were arrested for drunk driving in Grant and Adams counties. According to the Washington Traffic Safety Commission, officers across the state arrested 3,446 drivers for DUI using extra patrols from Thanksgiving through New Year's. During the same time last year in Grant and Adams counties, officers arrested 94 people for DUI. The extra patrols were funded by a grant from the Washington Traffic Safety Commission. You are being asked to help the homeless in Grant County. The Housing Authority of Grant County is looking for volunteers interested in assisting with Grant County's annual homeless count on January 24th. An informational meeting takes place at 11.30 a.m. on Thursday at Grant Integrated Services, which is located at 840 East Plum in Moses Lake. Lunch is provided. Interested volunteers are asked to contact Stephanie Bonwell at sbonwell at hagc.net or by calling her at 509 762 5541, extension 126. The Soap Lake City Council already met and talked about a long list of work they have ahead of them. Here with the report is Ryan Lancaster. Soap Lake's first city council meeting of 2013 covered a range of items last week, starting with an update from new city fire chief Dan Shields. Shields took over from Chief Tony Lidbetter the first of the year and is now working to restructure the city's fire department. Staffing inadequacies have led to missed emergency calls, and Shields has 60 days to turn things around before the city considers a contract with Fire District 7. Shields told the council he's already brought on six new volunteers and has plans to interview eight more. We have 16 applications on board. That 16 will include the previous fire chief <coughs> and the other uh, volunteer that's already on the department. So sounds like they want to stay and help out and make this move forward. In other business, Mayor Raymond Gravel asked for council permission to form a task force that will weigh the annexation of neighboring areas over the coming year. While he was vague on which city boundaries may expand, he said they'd likely be those to the north and the south. We're going to dig out uh, with the help of the city planner what the timeline is, what the process is, what the ramifications are, what are the pros and cons, what are the costs, all of the issues that we need to be fully versed on. Uh, before we decide if this is something we want to move forward with. A couple of residents spoke up about an ongoing lack of adequate water pressure in areas of East Soap Lake. Roughly a dozen property owners get about half the water pressure of those on the rest of the system. Robert Brown said the issue has been put off for years and asked the council to fix it. If you have an opportunity to do something that your predecessors did not do, and we would appreciate very much to be equal with the rest of the citizens in the water delivery system. Gravel told him the city engineer estimates a complete fix would cost $350,000, but he's asked for a smaller scale proposal that could be done with the aid of grants. I would say that it's probably not something that's going to be fixed uh, in the next few months, but we'd certainly like to see something happening this year. The council approved a rough draft developer agreement as part of the process of getting the lava lamp project off the ground. The agreement outlines construction requirements and dictates the city will take possession of the project once it's complete. A groundbreaking won't take place until funding for the project is secured, but Gravel said he'd like it to be this year, seeing as it's the 50th anniversary of the lava lamp's invention. And I think it would be uh, just a wonderful piece of synchronicity to have the lava lamp dedicated uh, in 2000 on the 50th anniversary. For iFiber One News, this is Ryan Lancaster reporting. The Grand Coulee City Council recently voted to pay Police Chief Mel Hunt $42,900 for overtime. According to the Star newspaper, the overtime dates back to 1976 
when Hunt was hired. Hunt switched to a different compensation plan in 2011. The city has reportedly been trying to resolve Hunt's complicated accumulation of extra time. A document authorizing the payout was signed by Grand Coulee Mayor Chris Christofferson in September of 2011. Hunt's 2013 hourly rate is $47 per hour, but he will be paid at his past rate. The Bonneville Power Administration plans to replace 28 miles of high voltage line from Grand Coulee Dam to Creston in Lincoln County. The line was built in 1941 uh, and wooden poles and aging equipment need to be replaced. The BPA is taking public comment on plans that include building temporary access roads. Construction could begin in the summer of 2015. Each of the people you see here have warrants for their arrest and are wanted by various law enforcement agencies. If you see any of these people, the DOC asks that you not attempt to detain or apprehend them, but to call police. You can also call the Department of Corrections at 509-764-6180 during the day or 509-762-1160 after 5 p.m. We'll be right back after these messages with the latest from our iFiber One Weather Center, sports, and more news from around the Northwest. <laughs> 